Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second or the third, or how you want to call it, Pillar Talks. Um, I'm joined today by our head of mobile engineering, Kieran. But Kieran so far isn't a speaker yet. So, Kieran, just let me give me a second just to check if you are invited. Uh, it says to me that here you are invited to the stage as a speaker. So whenever you're ready, just hop on in. Uh, in case we have some problems, we're going to solve that in a moment. I do... Um, I see a lot of you people have joined already, but for those who are perhaps listening to us from YouTube, um, hello, welcome to the call again. Just let me see. Just let me see. Kieran says he did request to be a speaker, uh, so I'm just gonna like invite him again. Let's see, add speakers, and the speaker would be Kieran. Here we go. Uh, Kieran, I sent you another invite. Let's see. Yeah, I've got it. Here we go. I'm in. Welcome, welcome to the stage. How are you doing? I'm good, mate. How are you? Yeah, doing good. Pretty excited. Yeah, me too. Had me some good too. numbers today as well. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's do the introduction and we'll go on right into uh, UX. So for those who are unaware of what we do on these pillar talks or what we do on these talks in general, we pick a certain topic that's happening in the web-free space. Uh, last week, we talked about account extraction. If you are curious about account extraction, since it's a very hot topic, we have the recording on YouTube. So you guys can go to our YouTube channel and check it out. I was joined by our... Uh, also one of our team members, Alden, and we had a pretty good discussion about account obstruction and what it means and all of the EIPs and everything. So we'll whittle it down, made it simplified for users. And uh, that's something we're going to do today as well. Today, our main topic is UX, and the title is how UX will drive web free adoption. So UX is obviously a fundamental part of any um, web experience. Web 2 or Web 3, doesn't matter. UX is like one of those things you cannot avoid and it's very important. And we'll be talking about why it's so important today. That's why we're joined with our head of mobile engineering, Kieran, today. So, Kieran, um, you said hello, so maybe we should just get right into the thing. Um, let's compare what's been happening. You know, the dawn on the internet has been there for a lot of years now, but Web3 is still relatively new for many and people are still onboarding onto Web3, but they have some problems and we'll be talking about them as well. But for comparison, maybe not um, UX specifically, but let's compare Web 2 and Web 3. Like, what are some of the differences? What's been going on with Web 2 in the past and what's going on with Web 3 right now? So let's go step by step. Yeah, <clears throat> no problem. So yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone for, ha uh, for having me. Hopefully it's just going to be a, a great information sort of session and, you know, a bit of an educational one too. If you get to learn something, then, you know, I'll be pleased. So. Yeah, let's talk about Web 2 uh, versus Web 3. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hot topic right now. And I think, you know, the, the biggest thing I want to say is that we've been here before. We've been here before. <clears throat> and I just sort of want to cast your minds back, depending on how old you are. But let's, let's rewind the clock 30 years, 30 years. We're going to go backwards in time 30 years. And, you know, we're going to talk about the dawn of Web 2. What we know now as Web 2, which was... It was online shopping. It was it was MySpace. It was MiniClip. It was Newgrounds. It was it was Flash Player. Do you remember Flash Player? Do you, re <laughs> do you know what I mean? Oh, like, God, okay. we're, we're, yeah, I'm a bit, I'm a bit younger than you, maybe. I remember Flash Player. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was still yeah, around. You know? <laughs> <laughs> still, yeah, we, we, MySpace, know, not so much, but uh, New uh, yeah. Newgrounds and Flash <clears throat> is okay. <laughs> yeah, e exactly. You know, there was Flash games. Uh, flash movies it was i mean it was it was incredible you know and it was it was an amazing place and you know people were obsessed with with going on their computer and you know whenever they would come home from work and and, and come home from school or college and they would just browse the internet it was the thing to do it was like browsing the internet you know chatting to your friends um you know it was it was an incredible time because people were discovering uh, this new method <clears throat> this new way of sort of talking to each other uh, communicating uh, goods and services you know um, amazon.com uh, launched in 1994 and it was people were blown away that they could order a book and you know um which is what it was back then and then have it delivered to their door like this this was this was revolutionary they could pay for stuff online and then came ebay and, and all the others sort of followed it so we've been here before um, and you know this was this was thirty years ago, but we've had thirty years to perfect the infrastructure <clears throat> that um, helps us um, 
that drive helps us drive a beautiful user experience when it comes to web two. Now, now, if you want to sign up to Amazon or if you want to buy something or you want to order a taxi, the experience, the user experience is so refined. It's so refined. It's unreal. You know, you, you could, um, you could show Uber to your mum or your dad, and then within like five minutes, there'll be there'll be a taxi at your door, which is which is incredible, right? And and this is how far we've come when we think about uh, when we think about where we've come from and thirty years towards now, year twenty twenty three, uh, and it's the same with food. It's the same with shopping. Um, you know that these user experiences are incredibly refined, um, and we 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 know what the internet is capable of. <clears throat> but with Web3, we're not really there yet. And, you know, I keep, I keep saying the word, I keep saying the numbers of 30 years. And this is purely because um, we've had that amount of time um, to perfect the infrastructure for goods and services, um, to perfect uh, their delivery systems and, and what have you, in order to be able to deliver a, an incredible, fast, you know, beautiful, almost natural user experience to users. And uh, and this is what we are trying to achieve now with uh, with Web3. Um, so, yeah, so so it's, it's an interesting comparison, Web2 versus Web3. It's almost unfair as well, but this is where we are. Right, yeah, but when we're talking about Web2 versus Web3, uh, do you have like an example we can use? Because yeah. you, but we've been talking about the history of Web two and everything. <clears throat> Web three is still relatively new, but like if you could do a direct comparison, perhaps or something like that, to, yeah. want, to make it easier for people. Sure, sure. So let's let's take the example. Let's let's run with the example of of buying something online, um, and. D this day and age, the idea of buying something online, it's, it's pretty sort of like, it's pretty cut and dry, right? You know what to expect. You're going to go onto a website, you're going to browse the products, you're going to look at something that you like, you might come back later, you might sign up for an account, you might put something on your wish list. You know, again, you know, I'm, I'm mentioning features here, but these are the features that I've had 30 years to mature, you know, and, and perfect. <clears throat> So we get that. Uh, then, you know, we go through the checkout process. You know, we put in our card details and our address and we pay for it. The infrastructure for that has had that amount of time to, to mature and to develop and to become easier over time. You know, hundreds of thousands of people will have worked on that over the course of 30 years. Um, and and eventually, you know, the, the the, the your, your parcel or whatever it is you've ordered will be handed over to the postal systems, which again have had time to change their systems to improve, to look back, uh, change the old stuff that wasn't quite working to adopt for this day and age, and then eventually it arrives at your door. <clears throat> Let's try and compare this now with um, with a web free experience. Now. In a nutshell, it might work something like this. And I'm just sort of like making this up as I go along now. But there might be an online shop of sorts in the same way. Um, the online shop, to verify your identity, will, um, will, will ask you for a signature from your wallet. Now, depending on how you've set this up, I mean, I'm going to presume that you've had to install a, uh, you know, a plugin called MetaMask, which most of us, um, if we know the space, will we'll know what MetaMask is. Um, at this point, I mean, this is already a point of friction. They have to go and find, uh, they have to go and find this. They've got to go and find it, and then they've got to install it, and then they've got to set it up. They've got to write down the 12 words. Um, they've got to note it. They've got to put the 12 words back into MetaMask to ensure. Then they've got to create the account and ensure that they're on the right network. Already, already, this is too much. This is too much. This is a nightmare already. Um, and then they're going to continue buying their product. Let's say they've got that. Then they need to find their funds that they want to buy. Let's say they've found something they want to buy. Um, <clears throat> they're going to have to go to an, uh, an on-ramp provider. And what this is, basically, they'll these will take your traditional card details and they will let you buy whatever cryptocurrency is needed um, to, to purchase that product on the shop, for example, and then they'll deposit into your, into your account in MetaMask. Once you have that, I mean, already, already this is crazy, right? And then once you have that, you will need to um, approve several transactions probably along the way during your journey just to make sure it's still you. Um, and this would come up in the form of like pop-ups over and over and over again. Um, some of you will, will, will be listening to this and thinking, yeah, it's all about 
it's all about the pop-ups, you know. It's it's like something we've managed to get rid of in the Web two era. We've got it again in Web three pop-ups. So um, and then eventually you, your transaction will be made and the transaction is complete. But but just compare that to to how I explained the Web two flow, right? Something isn't right. So well, a lot isn't right at this moment in time. Um, and again, you know, we, we are we are just starting to really um, realize that we need to take UI and UX quite seriously in terms of like web-free interaction. But, you know, if you were to do a direct comparison of all the points I just mentioned, there were probably about 10, you know, friction points compared to maybe one or two that you would have um, in, a, in a web two, you know, shopping experience, right? So, so, this, is, so this, is, this is where we're at. This is where we're at when we talk about web two and web three, and this is what we need to change. You know, um, I obviously know how hard this is sometimes, but having you talk about these steps one by one, <laughs> you know, they they begin to seem so confusing for the. It's like I've been using this for years, right? And <laughs> when you well, when you present it to me like that, you know, it sounds like I don't want to do this anymore. It's just yeah, <laughs> I know, insanely it's, hard, not, right? And now imagine that, imagine man. trying to explain this to your dad. Uh, like, okay, well, there's this uh, cryptocurrency you need to use, but you need to do like fifty more steps, right? And it's probably more expensive. <laughs> yeah, so, it, 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 yeah, exactly. Good luck. It, it, yeah, good it, luck. Exactly. You know, it's it's, it's really frustrating. You know, and uh, it's it's boring as well to to, mm, to yeah. have to sort of go through all that. Yeah, right. But there's there's a the thing like Web two uh, been here long enough, so Web two has learned from its mistakes. They basically got rid of all the unnecessary steps. They got rid of all the you know extra stuff, the redundant stuff that doesn't need to be shown to the user. That's basically good UX. But um, how do we know this good UX? How do we know this bad UX? Like, how, what happens first, you know, when you are just a yeah. regular user? Like, how does that happen? <clears throat> well, let, yeah, let me talk to you. So, so it's really important to, to highlight this particular fact about UX. User experience is, is, is very human and is closely tied to our feelings. You know, a good UX um, invokes great great feelings of like happiness um you know you feel good you feel like you've accomplished something um you know it's it's generally improved your mood it's it's very um you, you know the two ux and, and human emotions are very cohesive if you can create a great ux you'll often make people happy and this is this is so powerful i i cannot stress to you enough how powerful it is let me give you let me give you, um, you know, the opposite side of that coin. So let's say you've got a bad UX and you go to a website and the user experience is terrible. It's rubbish, right? And it's just something that you struggled with, you know, uh, you had lots of steps, you know, I'm sort of echoing what I just said. Um, you had lots of steps. It was frustrating. It took some time, you know, do you come back to that product? No. Yeah, unless unless it's really good, <laughs> unless it has a really good catch, you know, like yeah, like seventy yeah. percent off. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Most most people do not come back. They do not come back, and they'll go somewhere else. And the worst part is, is um, bad emotions tend to affect us, and you know, we remember bad things because just it's it's just human nature. We remember the bad things more than we remember the good things. So you'll often find that bad experience ripples um, uh, through you know communities, and, and you know people talk about bad things, and they they prefer to talk about uh, good things, right? And this is not just this is not just UX, but this this works with anything. It's just human emotion. So this is why I'm keen to highlight um, the, the, the sort of cohesion between user experience and how it makes you feel, but then the knock-on effects of that as well. So, you know, and as a human, you know, we're attracted to 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 beautiful things. We're attracted to nice, nice things, you know, flowers. Um, other humans, <laughs> you know, uh, artwork um, as well. Um, you know, we'll get on to we'll get on to a little bit about NFTs later, and, and that in that sense. Um, and you know, so so it pays um, to 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 put a lot of effort into good good experience, user experience. And you know, I'll give you a, an example of of good experience versus bad experience. I mean, it's and again, I'm not going to sp- reference anything specifically, but. If you've got a uh, 
if you've got like a, I don't know, a login page, for example, um, and, you know, a good experience would be, you know, it, it looks it looks good, first and foremost, you know, we have to take that into consideration. It's functional. So, for example, your cursor in the username box is already there and it's ready for you to so start typing. You know, you've taken a couple of steps out for that user straight away. Um, and all this adds up at the end of the day, you know, whenever the users enter their email address and you can detect this using code, um, you can move them straight onto their password, you know, so again, they can just type it in um, and you can even automatically submit um, the form if you've detected that they've stopped typing um, for a certain amount of time. Um, and there you have an example of a great user experience. You know, your, your feedback as well would be humanized. You know, your error messages would be humanized. It wouldn't just say like, incorrect password, try again. You know, and, and that is, we all know that that happens, you know, even today. Um, you would have a helpful error message, you know, you would have, the language would be would be unthreatening. Um, there would be a call to action saying, you know, have you forgot your password? The best experiences you see um, <clears throat> are, you know, I've come across login forms where I've got my password wrong twice and it sends me straight to the forgot password. And it's nice about it. It's like, don't worry, it happens to all of us. And then it just lets you reset your password. But the whole experience, even though it was it, it was it was the undesired effect, you know, a great user experience can take that and they can make it better. Another example is um, is uh, error pages on websites, you know, and this is a common thing now. A lot of big companies, especially, are starting to do this. But whenever there's an error page, um, what they will do is um, they will put like a funny picture or a, or a riddle or a joke on the page, you know, and and one thing we all hate to see in a 404 page, 404 or 500, right? They're the two most common error pages that you'll see. And most of the time you can't do anything after that, but a great user experience will allow the user to somewhat continue their journey. And if they tell you a joke or something on that page, then it immediately, it immediately, and this works on me, it immediately just makes you feel better, it, you know, and it, it negates that whole idea of, um, of oh, this, is, this brand is rubbish, you know, oh, these guys don't know what they're doing. Um, it immediately just kills that feeling entirely, and it, it saves you, it saves you as a customer as well. You know, you'll keep trying to shop. You'll sort of feel sympathetic. Um, again, coming to the idea of, of feelings. Um, and and then you will just continue continue as you were. So, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a nice, that, that's what good UX is. Bad UX is, <laughs> is, the, is the opposite of everything I just said. So imagine, you know, going to a login form and it didn't do anything when you press login, but actually your, your error message, there was an error message, but it was broken. Or it just said, try again, or something like that, you know, or um, it was badly designed or, or you know, the, the, the submit button was in a weird place. You know, sometimes we have this, uh, we have this thing in, on websites where actually even, even the average user is looking for a button. If, if that happens at all, then the user, the user experience is wrong and the user interface is wrong as well. So, <clears throat> you know, I would keep all them things in mind, like when we think about what is good, at, good UX and bad UX. But I think ultimately, you know, user experience is human and it is about the human and this is what we need to think about as well right right i was just about to ask like so the secret ingredient to good ux is the human touch right so it needs to sound human it can't yeah. sound robotic like you forgot your password <laughs> exclamation mark right you can't be like that you have to be like more human so that's the secret yeah thing. it's an art it's an art you know and um and you know, like I said, we're, we're as humans, we're attracted to to beautiful things. It, it, it alters our our behaviour. Um, and you know, if I if I could just give you a, a couple of like companies today that um, that that strive very well to do this, and some do it better better than others. Um, you know, let's talk about you know Microsoft, Apple, and Google, the, the big three. You know, um, the, these are these are household names. Uh, we we use their products every day. 
Um, some without even knowing it, you know, Microsoft we've got like ChatGPT, Apple we've got the iPhone, uh, Google we use Google Search all the time, all the time. It's ins- insane, and Android as well. <clears throat> um, so th- that often comes, you know, if when we talk about the the um, the study of UX, you have two different sort of schools of form, form and function. Um, you've got form, which is generally how it looks, how it feels. Um, you know, uh, uh, the message that the, the, the visuals convey to the user. Um, and then you've got, fu- you've got function, which is the thing that it's supposed to do. Um, <clears throat> now, what generally happens, um, and this is not just with, with these three companies, but it's, it's with any company that is developing a product. We, you know, even if it's a, a physical product, like a can, of, a can of drink or something like that, you know, um, people will either fall into two schools of thought, either the form or the function. <clears throat> now you've got Microsoft and Google. Uh, actually, I'll go through them one by one. With Microsoft, you know, they fell firmly into the form uh, sorry, into the into the function category. I mean, I want, just want to cast your mind back um, to to Windows. We're old Windows, right? Like Windows, Windows ninety five, Windows ninety eight, Windows ME, Windows two thousand, Windows NT. Um, like, all, all I, these... I can go with XP, but that's too much for me. That's too old. <laughs> no, yeah, well, no, no. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, actually, actually, with like Windows XP, like that is an interesting one because that that was the operating system that caught the mass market. I'm so glad you said that because it's a great. Yeah, thing. XP. Yeah, yeah. so many people so many people do but but windows xp um was the first time you know that microsoft really tried with form and function and look at the effect that it had it was yeah. it, it was it blew up windows xp blew up and it's still like the one of the much loved operating systems like of today um, yeah. but before that if you think about the operating system before even just look at screenshots of of windows 95 and if you if you ever look at screenshots of Windows ninety five now, you look at it and go, "What were they thinking?" Right, and that is because <laughs> they fell. Yeah, it's madness, right? They fell in. They fell firmly into the function category uh, because at the end of the day, back in the day, Windows ninety five, nineteen ninety five. Um, you know, Microsoft was run by a massive bunch of nerds, uh, and they, they will, they will, um, they will, f- they will fall into the function category. Um, then, you know, so this only now, of course, you know, form and function is is what the, what everyone strives for. However, take the opposite end of that, Apple. So we all know Apple for, um, you know, the, the, the iPhone, um, OS X, MacBooks, MacBook Pros and stuff. And, and it's inherently different. You can look at these products and, and you can feel the DNA of these products is different. Um, you know, you use OS X. Um, you know, uh, and it's it's you can feel it's different. It looks beautiful. It speaks to you. Um, you know, some people don't some people don't like this, but most people do. And the best example I can give of this is obviously the iPhone. Now, with everything Apple has has designed and built, they always strived for form and function, and this is incredibly hard to do. This is incredibly hard to do. You've got to get the nerds and you've got to get the designers together. You've got to get them to work together. This is this is hard to do. You know, if, if anyone has ever worked with digital agencies or anything like that, to put these two um these two schools of thought together is, is incredibly difficult. But Apple put the time in, they put the effort in, and it paid off. Um, because you know, well, you know, they don't have the biggest market share now, but back, but they managed to bridge that gap between technology and, and humans that, you know, they made everything beautiful. They made you want to really want to use it. And, and you know, anyone could pick it up and go, oh, that, that looks nice. What's that? And, um, and actually, I'll tell you a quick story about, um, <clears throat> about when Apple was launching the, the, uh, the iPhone and they were going around. Um, there was a period, in, you know, before the iPhone 1 launched and they were, um, they were going around sort of buying up patents um, and one of the patents they bought was for the capacitive uh, touchscreen. And I watched the, you know, a, a documentary about this, and it was it was fascinating. And um, 
And the guy uh, that sold, you know, the patent um, for the capacitive touchscreen, which is what we all know today is like the standard, um, uh, you know, when he when he when the lawyers came and he signed it all over under pressure, you know, from from their lawyers, um, I think he the device that he developed, he just he threw it against the wall and it just smashed to bits. Anyway, months later, months later, you know, he he got a um, he got an iPhone. He, the one was given to him, you know, probably, you know, probably by by Apple or someone that works there, you know, just to see what they've done with the technology, his technology. Um, and his daughter, his daughter was playing with it. And that night before she went to bed, she said to her dad, you know, she said, oh, can I take the magic phone to bed with me? And if you can have that amount, that effect on on someone, then you've won. You've done it, right? You've done it. And, and that is just an interesting, you know, th- this, this, this girl didn't know anything about about technology. You know, she was too young, but she she felt drawn to it. She felt attracted to it enough to sort of think it was like a teddy bear, you know. And she wanted she wanted to sort of take it to a bit. So so that that just goes to show the the powerful human effects that that you can that you can create if you get the form and function right together. Um, <clears throat> so and then just moving on to Google, uh, Google fell into the same trap. That Microsoft did. Um, you know, we think about the first versions of Android. They were god awful. You know, um, remember, um, don't remind anyone. Let people forget yeah. about those. <laughs> yeah. remember, remember the stylus. Yeah, yeah, we've <laughs> we've, we've 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 come a yeah. long way, baby. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Google, you know, Google were god awful. Everything was terrible as well at Google. And again, they fell into the same trap that Microsoft did. They went for function. It, you know, Google were famous for for hiring um, turbo nerds, right? And uh, they, they were famous for it. So they didn't understand, like, well, why do we need beautiful design? We'd rather have it work, you know, which is which is true to to an extent. Um, and it was uh, it was only later on, much later on, Google hired their first designer. And um, you know they they were super late to the game, right? Mad late they were. And uh, but when they did, you know things started to change. All of a sudden, Google search started to look better. They started to take their typography seriously. They started to take their uh, you know image density and densities and stuff like that seriously. They they started to take it all seriously. And then now they've found it's taken a long time for Google, given that they are an information company. Um, but now they have found, and actually, I would say that they are pioneering. Um, the design space with uh, material design and material you um, and they've they've done really well but they, they are like the latest to the party uh, for sure um, so yeah there we go that's how that's that's a little history a little bit of history in terms of like how modern companies today came came to good UX you know, wow you know the the story about the uh, touch screen I didn't know I didn't know about that that was a that's a yeah. pretty good story Oh, pretty yeah. great story. Oh, oh, always sticks with me that does, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Oof. So we talked about we did a lot of uh, history of Web two, right? But we didn't go too much into Web three. We just we just said it's very hard. <laughs> well, let's give it let's give it a <laughs> bit more. Let's give it a bit more detail. It's obviously the main topic of today, and we go went back and yes. talked about everyone everything but Web three, right? So let's yeah, stick to yeah. Web three for now. Uh, what's going on with Web3? What do we have right now? What's going on with uh, UX and Web3 right now? <clears throat> so, you know, it, it's it's interesting because we've had a couple of advancements recently in, in regards to, like, smart wallets. But the main bulk of, um, you know, the, the, the main sort of friction points with, with Web3 is you need to have a wallet, you need to have a client, um, there needs to be a way to, for this to communicate. There needs to be a way to transact. Um, there needs to be a way, you know, for you to um, for you to have funds on the account. There needs to be a way for you to buy it, and then there needs to be a way for you to spend it. Um, it th- there's two, you know, this this is what this is what we have now, um, and it's important to know <clears throat> that one big thing with Web three is we can't go backwards. We can't go backwards. You can only go forwards. That is the nature of the blockchain. Everything is historical. We can't go backwards and go, right, we're going to change some data here. This just, it just doesn't work, right? That's just not how the blockchain works. Um, or we're going to reorganize the data. Or we're going to uh, delete some stuff here. Or we're going to change the shape of this data. That is just something that cannot be done. So the only thing that we can do 
is we can move forward with what we have now and we can build on top of and we can migrate our users over. So so what we have now, you know, is, is a very, I think, varied ecosystem. You know, we have many, many blockchains now, um, which again, this is, this is sort of another problem. Uh, we've, we've got many blockchains, you know, we've got many wallets, we've got many ways of, of wallets talking to each other, we've got many ways of um, of doing one particular thing, you know, and, and the thing is, is the whole um, idea of, you know, the Ethereum ecosystem or blockchain ecosystem is that it is it is open and it is open source. And, and what this means is anyone can take the source code that is used to build that application or that blockchain and they can make one of their own. Now this is this is critical, right? And what I mean to say is this is this must be allowed to happen because that's how people change and innovate, and that's how we improve products. But at the same time, we've reached this point of like saturation where you know every man and their dog has got their own blockchain. And you know, again, we, we should not move backwards, but we need to roll forwards. Um so what we need to do is we need to um we need to find bridges and solutions to be able to join these experiences together as one. Very interesting. Uh, okay, let's see. So uh, when you go, obviously there, there are things to learn and there are things we did. I just want to give you like a brief uh, brief story how my uh, UX experience went web free. It was like two or three years ago. Um, it was... Hmm. I can't remember the huge event that happened at the time. It was, it could have been, uh, when was the Uniswap airdrop thing? Well, that was 2019 or 2020? 2020. Uh, I can't, yeah, I can't remember, but I, I remember that as well. I think it's 2020. And like just before that, or the year before that, actually, I can't even remember. It's been um, like a year in crypto is like five years in, <laughs> in the normal space, right? But um, I remember doing like a transaction the first time and I, I had like zero knowledge and it was on Ethereum and the fees weren't too high. So it had to be like a three, four, five years ago, right? Because today I would notice the fees. <laughs> but um, and I tried to do like a simple transaction. I tried to provide liquidity. I was teaching myself how liquidity works. And um, I was like, okay, so I need to do 50% of this, 50% of this. And I went to swap it uh, back in Uniswap. And I... Um, I assumed I did the swap because I pressed approve. And then I figured out like two hours later that, you know, the transaction went through, but that wasn't actually for the transaction. It was just yeah. for the token approval. <laughs> so I was like, well. okay, but why, why did I pay money for this? And that was my, <laughs> I, I was already like, okay, I hate this stuff. I, I, I don't want to yeah. do this. And, yeah. uh, you know, lots of, lots of things uh, can, you know, I can just imagine how it goes for normal users. Like this is me. I was a normal user back then. I guess I'm a power user in a hash. Uh, now, because I've been using crypto for two years, so I'm pretty used to all this stuff. But like first time having this experience, not so well, not so good. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and and, and you know, it's it's interesting because that same thing happened to me. I remember it. I remember it, it wasn't on Uniswap; it was something else. But that same thing happened to me. I did not know what an approval was. Right, no mm. idea what an approval was, um, and I didn't understand that you had to like authorize, you know, Uniswap to spend your funds. Like it, people don't know this. People don't know this. Yeah, can you can you know. can you give us like a like a how how do I say this? Like, what does what does the approval even do? Like, there's people today who probably don't know what it does right and why yeah, it happens. So an, uh, yeah, uh, basically, an, an approval it's a protection mechanism. An approval uh, will give another smart uh, another app, right? See, I'm dumbing down my words here <laughs> just on purpose. It will yeah. give another app permission to spend your money. That's what it does in a nutshell. Uh, and then and then after that, you know, that app can go ahead and move some funds around because you've already said ahead of time, yeah, this app can spend X amount of, you know, X amount of funds. Go ahead. So that's what that's what an approval transaction is. Right. So um what's uh so we talked about all these stuff, like um, but we in the meantime we kind of fixed this approval thing with batching transactions and stuff like that. This is getting more and more adapted in the space. So I guess we can say that we kind of improve the experience for the users, especially once they have to skip they don't have to do this stuff manually. It happens, you know, in the background. Yeah. Um, but what's still missing? What what do we have like compared to a couple of years ago when we both did this mistake? What do we have now and what like what's still missing? What needs to be done so, if we want users so to like have it easy job? Yeah. So, so first of all, I mean, you know, um, I, I would say what's still missing is is you know seamlessness and cohesion. 
is is still missing. You know, the 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 fluidity between the experience of you know, um, or, uh, um, uh, making a transaction, making an approval, swapping. Um, it still re- it it still requires um, friction points, like pain points, really. Um, you know, it still requires you to do things. It still requires you to approve stuff. Uh, again, you know, like you've mentioned with the advent of like you know buy, uh, smart smart contracts and and um, you know smart wallets and being able to batch stuff together. We've we've come some part of the way, but not everyone is using such advanced wallets that they can um, they can take advantage of this. Um, and you know, we've we've. We, we've also, um, and it's, it's important to note that we've also improved the UI and UX layer a lot as well. So, for example, now, you know, on Uniswap, for example, or, or, or one inch or the other, or one of the other decks is like, you know, it, they now give you clearer instructions about what's going to happen and when it's happening. And they usually will show you a progress bar. So we've, we've, we have really come a long way, um, but there's still, you know, the, there's some things that we can't change, such as like uh, you know a, a, a pop up for approving transactions, and maybe uh, with enough innovation and time, again coming back to that whole thirty year mark, um, we will eventually develop solutions that will become adopted by technology companies that will allow this friction to slowly but surely be eroded. Um, so you know this is it, we really have to give this time, you know. Um, for this to for this to to sort itself out, right? And um, you mentioned thirty years. Yeah, well, it still hasn't been thirty years, and it's been it's going to take some time until we get to the thirty year mark. But like, w- what will get us there? I think we have a secret weapon that we're going to introduce on April fourth, and you can perhaps even mention it now. Uh, but like, how do we get there from right now, where it still isn't? Perfect? Well. Yeah. So first, first and foremost, you know, we need we need great UX. We need great UI. Um, you know, th- this we have to think about this. If if I'm going to, if I'm going to go to my next door neighbor Pat, who's about like ninety, and and explain cryptocurrency to her, you know, it, it's going to have to be friendly. It's going to have to. Um, it's the 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 user interface is going to have to be obvious. You know, the user experience is going to have to be uh, friendly and welcoming. Um, another thing that we haven't we haven't touched on, but this needs to change, is the normalization of terminology. So the amount of times, you know, that, that, that I ex- try to explain, and I fall into this trap as well, but I try to explain stuff to, uh, you know, <clears throat> my wife or, or my son or my friend and um and i'll start dropping words that they have no idea you can see i've lost them straight away i start yeah. dropping words like, like you know smart contract <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah my, son, my son's like shut up you nerd and uh, <laughs> and uh you know, I start dropping words like, you know, smart contracts and transactions. And you can see that they're just turning off. They don't get it. They don't know what to say. They, they don't yeah, know I can what see their faces will. right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It, it, exactly. And, and one thing that we really need to do, you know, great UI and UX is one thing, but we need to talk to these prospective users. That, and we, we want these people, right? We want to onboard the next billion people. On, on, onto on, on into this ecosystem and in order to do that we cannot we cannot alienate um you know people ever you know we we have to dumb it down um and we have to explain it to them in a way that they can understand otherwise they will just be like well this is just too complicated and they'll close the app they'll uninstall it they'll never come back and they'll they'll stick to their web 2 world that have that have perfected this as an art you know i can't I can't go to my dad and I can't drop words like smart contracts, gas, externally owned accounts, zero knowledge proof, roll-ups, L0, L1, L2, 12 words, private keys. Do you know what I mean? I can't, I can't, I can't, wow. you can't go to, you know, people that you know and explain it with, they will have no idea what you're talking about. And the first thing you do is you alienate them, you make them feel bad uh, and they just, Again, coming back to the, the human emotion side of it, um, you make them feel bad, and they don't come back. You're done. You've lost them. Right. Yeah, I still, I still have trouble uh, teaching my older folks. Well, not my parents. <laughs> they're pretty good with technology. But, like, uh, grandma, grandpa, you know, they, they, they were still struggling with, like, touch screens. 
<laughs> so yeah. how do yeah. you get how do you get from a touch screen into like uh, crypto i don't think i don't think it's going to be that easy but yeah. there's hope for the you know the not the younger generations but like for them up until 60 i think it's it's possible that they'll they'll be there in a time where this is super simplified right yeah i completely agree mm. yeah we just need to give it time and innovate. Right. Now, what kind of innovations do we need for these guys? For, not for these guys, like for <laughs> like what, what kind of innovations do we need uh, in the space for everyone to be like, well, you know, I guess this was hard before, but they kind of explain it good now. I think I want to so, do this. I yeah, want to try this yeah, out. Well, let's yeah. Well, it's it that's a that's a great question, and you know, innovation comes is born out of creativity and and a need. Um, so you know. We can talk about um, uh, NFTs, NFTs and gaming. You know, these these are two great categories that um, lend themselves to, to bridging, um, or you know, br bridging that, closing that chasm. You know, like yeah. crossing the chasm, as they say. You know, and um, between the Web two world and Web three world, or between the normal people and the nerds, right? And it's it's it's, it's interesting because nothing did that better than NFTs. And I'm giving you an example of something that that was an innovation. You know, yeah, we, we took you we know, took a token standard, and then we we basically um, we 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 turned it into something that was universal across both Web two and Web three, and this brought so many people, so many people. On you know into the web free space, and these are the sort of uh, mechanisms that we need to keep innovating on in order to keep bringing people over. And they will be novel. They will be novel, and they might be silly, right? They might be mm -hmm. weird and silly, but but the point is, is that they bring it over. I mean, I re you know um, when when the iPhone launched, you know there were stupid weird apps in there, and you know there were just like ones that like. You pressed a button and it made like a fart noise, you know, and, and this ex this app exploded. Now, obviously, Apple obviously don't want that sort of app in there, but they understood at that moment in time that they need to onboard people to that technology. And inadvertently, um, at the same time, that that app was showing, was demonstrating the user interface and the possibilities to new users. If you try to submit an app like that now, you get banned. Right, straight away. <laughs> yeah. So, but, yeah. <laughs> but back then, you know, these these things were novel, and you know, they made people laugh. And 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 from that point, it's like, oh well, what is that? What is that that you've got there? How how are you doing that? And then and then the rest is history. So so with a gaming and NFTs, this these are are great sort of um, innovations that came out of standards, Ethereum standards, um, that we should continue to capitalize on, but also think of other ideas as well. And this will come with time. Hmm. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. So um, do you have like a conclusion to all of this? I guess we're nearing the end. Yeah. Well, like how? Well, I, well, I can tell you. I mean, what do I think a perfect world looks like? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think a, a perfect world, you know, is where users, no matter who they are, um, can't tell the difference between something that's that belongs to the Web two world and something that belongs to the Web three world. You know, the, these technologies they they will work together. They will feel the same. They will act the same. Um, you know, users. Um, you know, people will be able to move in and out of these worlds, you know, cross, cross the world from Web 2 with Web 3, like, and they won't even know it. It will be, it will be beautiful. It will, it will make them feel good. It will be synonymous. It will, it will improve their life. It will, it will enrich their life. Um, and, and all this, you know, can be achieved with great user experience and great user uh, interfaces as well. So I think that's what we need to we need to work on. And, you know, just just as a note, you know, we we really need more UI designers. We need more UX engineers. Um, there just isn't enough. There's not enough. There's not enough in this space right now. There's loads of them out there working on traditional media and, you know, they're doing great work. But, you know, my mind can only wonder what can they, you know, if these engineers, these UI designers and UX engineers were brought into the web free world, like where would we be in a year's time? So, yeah, you know, but when we're talking about onboarding um, designers and engineers, you know, uh, mm -hmm. obviously they aren't accustomed to web free and they aren't accustomed to the languages of web free. 
Um, how do we onboard them? We have a, I think we have a secret ingredient. I think you'll be excited yeah. to showcase it. Uh, we have a demo or uh, however yeah. you want to call it two weeks from now. So well, I invite everyone to join it. Yeah, well, you know, what we've done is is uh, we've developed a uh, React, um, a React um, component library that allows um, designers and developers, you know, who do not have any blockchain experience uh, whatsoever to be able to build beautiful user interfaces however they want, you know, bring your own UI. And critically important is, you know, we will handle the technology, the components, the React components, they handle the tech behind the scenes. And this is uh, this is powered by our own very own Etherspot as well. Um, so you know, designers uh, can just simply you know um, uh, in, uh, use their, they use these React tags, and you know, within these React tags, they can define whether they want to send transactions, they want to move tokens, um, you know, they want to talk to smart contracts, they want to interact with the ecosystem, but they only they they just have to use. Uh, you know, React component tags. That's all it takes. We've handled all the hard work um, and we've done all the sort of blockchain coding behind the scenes so they don't even need to touch an SDK. You know, they don't need to sign up to any services. They don't need to put their credit card down. Um, you know, they can just write great code, build beautiful user interfaces, and that should be their priority. So this is what we're doing um, to, to advance uh, that space. I think that's a pretty good showcase. Uh, just to let everyone know, who I see we had some record-breaking numbers. There was more than 800 people. 850 people, actually, Kieran. You're very charismatic. You brought a lot of people here on the show. You're very welcome. <laughs> uh, we uh, we want to invite you to the next um, call that we'll be having. It's not exactly a pillar talk. It's more dev-oriented, since we'll be talking about exact details of the transaction. Again. It's going to be happening two weeks from now on a Tuesday. That will be April 4th. I'll be sharing with you guys uh, in a moment uh, in the comments of this Twitter space. I'll be sharing you some cool links if you want to check out the transaction kit. We had a blog post recently where we talked about the transaction kit. Um, so here it is for yourselves. I'm just going to paste it here. So it's one of the core features of Etherspot right now. It's pretty new. It's pretty groundbreaking, but um, it's more dev-oriented, I guess. So yeah. But in case you perhaps not consider yourself tech savvy, but you still want to learn something new and you want to learn the technology, come visit us next time because we'll be talking about it in, in more detail. Yeah, and we're going to give you, we'll, we'll give you a live demo as well. And actually, you know, if you want to try this out and if you're a developer and, you, you know, you know React or even a little bit of React and you want to give this a try now, you can just head over to transactionkit.com. Um, or .dev, um, and it doesn't matter which one. Um, but if you're a developer, head over to .dev and uh, hit the uh, code sandbox, and you can take it for a spin right now, and you can even fork it and start developing uh, your own blockchain apps straight away. Right. I think, think that's about it, Karen. Do you have anything else to add? No, but I'm looking forward to a bright and beautiful future in, in the web-free space, that's for sure. Right, right. I agree. So thank you, everyone, for joining. I see people are, <laughs> people are slowly leaving because we filled the <laughs> gap. We, we said the call was going to be 45 minutes, and uh, we just went five minutes overboard. But I think pe yeah. people who have been listening are fine with it. I don't think people will mind. But yeah, the, you know, the, we, raffle, the raffle on Link Free did end, so that could explain <laughs> some things. <laughs> yeah, of course. The and, raffle and, and closed also, down. And, and also, you know me, I like to talk. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. It's good. You might get guessed a couple of more times if you want to, you know. Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's, let's yeah. talk. Sure. Uh, anyway, for those who might have joined us a bit late or perhaps missed a certain part, we're going to be uploading this to our Pillar YouTube channel um, tomorrow, I believe, because I need to do some compil compiling and I need to do the uh, timestamps so you guys can know about each single question and answer uh, specifically so you could jump to your favorite part or you can listen to the part where you skipped it. Anyway, uh, that will be it from us. Thank you for joining the second or the third. I guess this is the second uh, official Pillar Talks. The first one was last week with me and Alden talking about account extraction. This would be the second one with me and Kieran talking about UX. Uh, we'll be surely doing more of these because I've seen more and more people joining these calls. So I think it's a great way to teach people about the complexity of web free while keeping it as simple as possible so thank you everyone uh developers react developers whoever you are go check out the transaction kit i'm sure you like what we were do doing 
and everyone else, uh, thank you for joining this call. Uh, hope to see you on many more future ones and hope to see you next Tuesday as well. Not next Tuesday, it's two Tuesdays from now, April 4th, where we'll be presenting that transaction again. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. Have a good day. Have a good week. Have a good weekend, everyone. See you next time. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.